So to get started, I just have a little outline of what I'll be covering today. We'll be quickly going over what is OLS, and OLS is Ordinary Least Squares Regression. So hopefully this is a review for most of you. And I'll also talk about some of the common issues in standard linear regression that you might be coming across in your day-to-day -day, um, analysis. I'll also point out some solutions to OLS, including nonlinear regression splines, stochastic gradient boosting, and random forests. Now these are common data mining algorithms, and I'll be showing them in our software, just as an example. I'll be using a concrete strength data set. This is just one applied example, and I'll also be talking about some case studies and other applications at the end for those of you who don't work in concrete strength. You'll be able to see that these algorithms can be applied in any industry. If we have time, I'll take questions at the end, and any questions that I don't get to, I'll answer offline after the webinar. Now this is the first part in a series of webinars. The second part will be at the same time next Wednesday, and I'll basically just be taking these algorithms to the next level, looking at advanced techniques and also some model automation to make your modeling quicker and easier. Okay, so let's get started. Again, if you have any questions, there is a questions pane in the webinar that you'll be able to enter them, and I'll be able to see them after the webinar and answer them, hopefully during the time we have today. But we are covering a lot of material for a short 45 minutes, so we'll see what we can get to. As I mentioned before, OLS is Ordinary Least Squares Regression. And I have some dates here just to show you that this method is pretty old. I mean, it was started in the early 1800s, and the Statistical Foundation came around the 1920s. The algorithms that we'll be looking at today as solutions to OLS are much more modern, even uh, 21st century methods. And that's why they do address some of the common issues that are found in OLS. The model for our standard linear regression is always of the same form. Here you can see response equals A plus B1, X1, and so on. So A is your intercept term. The B terms are your parameter estimates, and the X1, X2, X3 are your predictors. So this response surface is always going to be a global hyperplane. And the way to solve this problem is you're looking for a unique combination of values, the A and the Bs, to minimize the mean squared errors of predictions on the learned sample. Now the keyword here is on the learned sample. You're using all of the data, your entire data set, to build a model for a standard linear regression. We'll be addressing later how the modern algorithms use a testing method to monitor performance. And then at the end, usually you usually use stepwise approaches to determine model size for your regression. It's pretty straightforward. It's a basic approach that most statistics classes teach you right off the bat and most people know about. So what are some of the common issues that people run across in regression? These issues come up in data all the time. The first is missing values. It's natural that data collected in the world today is going to have missing values, especially survey data. If people aren't answering questions, for example. And the way to handle this in standard regression is that you have to delete the records that have the missing values, or you have to figure out a way to impute these values. And that can be time consuming. Or if you're deleting the records, you could be losing a lot of your data. Another problem is nonlinearities. Like I said before, regression is a global hyperplane. So you're ignoring the local effects that are happening in your data. And you can try to add these in, but it does require manual transformations by the analyst. And this, again, can be time consuming to find them. The same deal with interactions, manual detection by the analyst. You have to figure out which variables are interacting, and then you have to put them in your model. Variable selection. A lot of data sets recently I've seen have many, many predictors. You could have thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of available predictors, and how do you select which ones to use in your regression? Overfit into the learned sample, I mentioned on the previous slide that you're using all of your data 
to build the model. And so there's no use of a, no use of a test sample to monitor the performance. And so you tend to overfit to the learned sample. And what overfitting means is you're learning so much about all that data that it doesn't generalize well when the model sees new data. The solution can become unstable in the presence of collinearity. And a unique solution does not exist when the data becomes wide. And what this means is wide data is when you have many, many columns relative to the number of rows. And this is common in bioinformatics data. So a lot of the common issues here can be fixed. Um, we're not saying that you can't run a regression because of these issues, but they're fixed by analyst intervention. This can be time consuming. And the methods I'll be showing you today help out with finding these things automatically. And I'll go into those on the next slide. So the solutions that we'll be looking at, I mentioned before, nonlinear regression spines, stochastic gradient boosting, and random forests. So these methods automatically perform what OLS does not. It works with variable selection, missing value handling, nonlinearity detection, and interaction detection. We also use a test sample to prevent overfitting. And collinearity is not an issue with any of these data mining techniques. Now I just want to note here that these aren't the only solutions to OLS. These are just a few examples that tend to work well. There are a lot of different algorithms out there that you can use. And in particular, next week on part two, I'll be going even further into these to show you different features. And I also want to say that we're not saying here that OLS never works or that it's not a good solution. If your data can be fully explained by a simple global hyperplane, then OLS could be a good solution for you. These solutions we'll be talking about today are for data that needs further explanation that does have missing values or nonlinearities that you do want to account for. So I'll introduce the data set that we're going to look at today. You'll also receive this data set in the follow-up email. I pulled this data set from the University of California at Irvine Machine Learning Repository. It's a pretty popular website that has many, many data sets in different industries that you can download and play around with. So it's a great learning tool, and it has a variety of different data sets. So this is just a simple civil engineering example to illustrate the shortcomings of OLS, because this data does demonstrate some nonlinearities. So our target variable will be strength, and this is just the compressive strength of concrete. And just to give you an idea of the target variable that we're looking at, it ranges from about 2 to 82 megapascals. And this will be important when you see later, when we're monitoring the performance of our models, we'll be looking at how far off we are in predicting. I also have a list of the predictors here. These are just basic components of concrete, cement, water, coarse aggregate, and age. And so we'll just be seeing which one of these are contributing and maybe some that are interacting with each other. Some of the more advanced things, like looking specifically at interactions, will be covered in next week's advanced webinar. Again, I do realize that everybody in this webinar probably isn't working with civil engineering, so we will be covering later some of the other industries that this works well in. This is just a simple example. Another slide just to get an idea of this data. We don't actually have missing values in this particular data set. It's hard to find a data set to illustrate all of the common issues in regression within a short 45-minute webinar. So I will address missing values next week and how they are handled in the engines, but I do just want to mention that they aren't a problem. Missing value handling is done automatically, even though you will not see that today. So our target variable is on the far right here in bold, called strength. It is continuous. As I said, it ranges from 2 to 82. And we have continuous predictors as well. And categorical predictors, just as a side note, are not a problem. Now typically, to use ordinary least squares regression, you have to check a lot of assumptions. For those of you that have taken a statistics class, you know that before you start modeling, you do have to check for normality, constant variance. And if 
you don't meet those assumptions, you're supposed to proceed with caution or not proceed at all. So the good thing about these modern data mining algorithms is that they don't need assumptions. You don't have to assume anything about the model because the techniques are completely data driven. You're putting the data in and you're getting a model out based only on that data. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the software now so we can take a look at running a standard linear regression on this data set. We can see how well it performs, and that way we can compare to the modern data mining algorithms. So I'll switch over. Now I don't want to make this webinar too much about the software. It'll take up too much time, but this is our software predictive modeler. We call it SPM. This is our GUI version. And because you registered for this webinar, you'll be given instructions on how to download a free 30-day trial evaluation. Now, it is trial, but it is a functional version that you will be able to do everything I'm showing you today. So what I'll do is I'll import the data set. Just click this file. I find the concrete data set here, which you'll also be receiving. I'll click Open. We get a window that just tells us about the data. You can see the variables here on the left that I explained were. We have a little over a thousand records and nine variables. So this is a smaller data set for some of you out there. This might be big for you. This might be extremely small for you. It's good for this example. I can also take a look at the data by clicking data. Get a little spreadsheet of what we saw on the PowerPoint slide. Now I want to run, so I'll close out of this window, and I want to go to Model Setup. So there's a little shortcut up here. Our software has many different analysis engines. We have cart decision trees, logistic regression, regression splines, gradient boosting. So I'll be showing you a few of those today. just wanted to point out the other ones in case those pique your interest. For now, I'm just going to go to click Regression because we just want to run a standard OLS to see what we compare it to. So here we have Variable Selection window. I'll select Strength as our target predictor, as our target variable, sorry, and the rest as our predictors. We also have a Testing tab. As I mentioned, we typically use a separate test sample to monitor performance. In this case, we're not going to do any testing because we want to stay true to OLS and see what happens when we use all of our data on the learn sample. That's all I have to choose here. I just click Start and we'll be running our standard linear regression. What happens here is we get a summary window. We can see our mean squared error is around 107. And our R squared is around 62%. So this isn't too bad. Now we have our baseline model to work off of. And in any summary window that you get in the software, you'll see other tabs up here that tell you more about the model. You can check the coefficients and see which variables have the highest coefficient just to get an idea of which ones are contributing. So I'll switch back to the slides. So here I'm just filling in a table so we can keep track of how each of the algorithms are performing on this data set. And so in terms of concrete strength, this model is off about 10 megapascals. So we'll take the root of the mean squared error. And just recall that the range is 2 to 82. So to be off by 10 is pretty significant. And I apologize for switching back and forth between the slides and the software. I'll be doing that in between each algorithm just so you can keep them separate in your head. So let's start off with our first data mining algorithm. This is nonlinear regression splines. We call this MARS in our software, which stands for multivariate adaptive regression splines. And what this does is it takes all of your data and it tries to separate them into different regions and then fit regressions within each region. It uses knots to impose local linearity. So if you look at the pictures at the bottom of the slide, you'll see on the left, this is just a simple example of an XY relationship of two variables. The red points are your data points, and you're fitting a straight black line right through it. So on the left, this is your OLS. Now, it doesn't do a great job of 
capturing some of those higher values on the left and some of the values on the right that are above the line. So what happens here on the right then with Mars is you're picking these locations of knots and that's where the arrows are pointing. So when you pick these locations and then you fit um, separate lines between them, these are called basis functions. And this decomposes the information in each variable individually. This way, instead of having a global hyperplane, you're separating it to more local effects. And as you can see, the black line on the right fits the data much better. It's really capturing that overall pattern of those red data points. So it's, in a way, it's similar in nature to just setting up a bunch of different OLS models within your data space. And while we're talking about regression today, I just want to mention that Mars can also perform well on binary dependent variables. So if you have a 0, 1 or a yes, no target variable, Mars can also work well in that situation. So again, we have a short 45 minutes today and I'm introducing three extremely complex algorithms and how they are constructed. And so I can't go into exact detail on the entire process. If you are interested in that, I'll be going to more detail next week or we have many different resources on our website about how these all work. You can shoot us an email, ask a question in the question pane on the right, and we'll get back to you on that. So without getting into too much detail, I'll switch back to the software and we're going to run a nonlinear regression spline on the concrete data to see how it compares to that OLS that we just ran. So I'll leave this results window up so we can see. I'll go back to model setup, quick shortcut. All I need to do is change the analysis engine to Mars regression spines. Our variables are still selected here. Now for testing, for our data mining algorithms, we always recommend using a separate test set. You have a few options here. If you have a big data set, you can choose the second option to just take a random 20% or a random 50% of your data to test. You can have a separate test file, or you can use cross-validation. That's what I'll be using here. So I'll be using tenfold cross-validation. Now we also have a Mars tab here. And this is where you choose the number of basis functions to use. Now, if you remember, the basis functions are the separate um, pieces of that piecewise constant model that I showed you on the slides. And so we want to allow for many different changes in the variables. So I'm going to increase this number from 15 to 40. There's no set number of what you should do. This is something you'd have to play with if you want to work with your own data. All I need to do now is click Start. So now we have our Mars model. We get a little bit of a different window. We're given a graph of the number of basis functions um, as a result of the performance measure. And so I'll just click the Summary button here to bring up that same window that we saw for the regression results. So now we have mean squared error on both the learn sample and the test sample. As you can see, our test sample mean squared error is 34. Now this is a huge difference from the 107 that we just saw with regression. So we can already tell that there are nonlinearities in the data that Mars was able to capture that OLS was not. Our R squared is up to 88%, which is great. And this Mars model that I just built is capturing nonlinearities, but it isn't even capturing interactions. The first model I built here was no interactions. Next week, when we go into an advanced techniques, I'll be adding interactions in to see how much more we can boost that. So here again, the point of this whole exercise is to show you how quickly you can get to a good result without having to tweak a lot of parameters or without having to run several models just to get here. In these quick couple clicks, I was able to show the difference between regression and Mars, which is a huge difference. So we know that Mars works well here. Again, we've updated the results, and now we're only off by about six megapascals. Our R squared has increased 
quite a bit. The next important algorithm here is stochastic gradient boosting. Now this one is a little more difficult to explain. We're not talking about sets of regressions anymore like we were with Mars in different regions. We can't picture it that way anymore. Instead we're looking at decision trees. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with decision trees, I'll give a quick example of tree one down here. What happens is you have all of your data in this top root node of the tree. And the algorithm finds the best way to split this data into two different groups, two different subgroups that are as different as possible based on a splitting rule. So for example, if I had a huge group of people that I was trying to split into two groups, I might say, okay, I'll take everybody over the age of 50 on one side and everyone younger than the age of 50 on the other. And so it keeps splitting your data into subgroups to find the best separation. And so in this case, the nodes are color-coded at the end here, your final groups. There are six final groups from this tree. And groups that are dark red are very different from the groups that are dark blue. So this is just a simple data partitioning to split your groups into people that have different characteristics. Not necessarily people, just records in general. And so this is one decision tree here. This is called CART, if you've ever heard of classification regression trees. And what stochastic gradient boosting does is it builds an entire ensemble of these decision trees. They're built in an error correcting sequence. So you start with a small tree as your first model. That's tree one down here. You run your data through this tree and you produce predictions. Once you have these predictions, you'll have residuals from the model for every record. And what happens is when you build your second tree, you're trying to predict the residuals from the first tree. And this process goes on and on and on for a minimum of 200 trees usually. Sometimes we're building up to thousands of trees. And they're all added together at the end to produce an extremely accurate model. It's very fast. It's efficient. It's completely data-driven. So like I mentioned before, there are no assumptions to running this TreeNet model. We call it TreeNet in our software, but it is just a stochastic gradient boosting algorithm. TreeNet is also immune to outliers and invariant to monotone transformations variables. So that can be extremely useful in your analysis as well. TreeNet in particular is also one of the algorithms that I'll go into more detail next week because TreeNet has many different features. This is actually my favorite algorithm to use. It's extremely accurate and it's what's responsible for most of the wins that Salford has in data mining competitions. So I'll switch back to the software and we'll run a TreeNet model. Back to model setup here. I'll choose TreeNet gradient boosting. Our variables are still selected as the same here. You'll notice over here too we have a box for target type. So here we are showing you regression. That's the main topic of this webinar. But if you have a classification problem or a logistic binary problem, it's supported here as well. The next tab is testing. We want to make sure we're using our testing method, cross-validation. And the reason I chose cross-validation here and for the Mars model is that our data set is fairly small. It's only a thousand records. So if we took a chunk of the data at random to use for testing, we might be um, causing some biased learn test partitions. So we just want to make sure that we're including all of the data for learning and all of the data for testing. And for those of you who don't know what cross-validation is, feel free to ask that question in the question pane and we can email you afterwards with more details. It is a little bit too complex to explain at this moment. We also have the TreeNet tab. This is where you can choose um, some of the parameters of the algorithm. As I mentioned before, you have to choose how many trees to build. So in the example I showed you on the slide, there were only three, but we do usually use a minimum of 200. In this case, I'm actually going to up it to 500, just so you can see that you can build many, many trees extremely quickly. 
I won't go into any of the other advanced details here right now. Still just want to show how quick and easy it is to get your preliminary tree net model that will still give you good results. Bottom right here, I'll click Start. So for how complex the algorithm seems, these trees are growing extremely quickly. We're building 500 of those small CART decision trees, and we're also using cross-validation folds, so those are done in parallel. Okay, so the tree net output we get here, you can see the number of trees built in the model, all the way up to 500, against the performance measure. So shown here is the mean absolute deviation. We can switch this to mean squared error. You can see it decreases. We also have the graph for both the learn sample and the test sample. You can see they travel together, which is always a good sign to know that your two partitions are behaving in similar ways. We also have R squared here, if that's the measure that you prefer. Again, we have the summary window. This shows you all of these measures, whether you like to use mean squared error, R squared, if you're interested in the AIC and BIC criteria, those are included as well. Here we're seeing on our test sample, we're getting mean squared error about 37. So this is around the same as we got with the Mars model. Um, I don't want to compare between the different data mining algorithms because they do offer different advantages. The most important thing to take away here is the extreme improvement over the standard linear regression. We have an R squared around 87%. Now I do want to point out a few more things in the summary window that can give you insight into your model. So we are seeing that we're getting great results and that's awesome, but what else can you learn from these algorithms? You can also look at your data set. So you can see if any records were deleted or if there were any missing values. The variable importance tab is one that I always look at. This is a quick way to see which variables are contributing the most to your model. Here we can see that age of the concrete is most important contributing to strength, and that makes sense. Cement and water are also extremely important. Now this tab is very useful if you have thousands of variables because a lot of your variables might not show up at all. So you might have a whole list here of variables that have zero importance. And in this tab, you can quickly do variable selection. So while the algorithm does variable selection for you, you can always highlight here. I can take the top five and I can rebuild the model just by clicking new keep and go with just those variables. So it's extremely easy to manipulate. You can also see information on your residuals, see if you might possibly have any outliers. Another important feature of TreeNet are the plots we're able to produce. So as you can see, we were able to look at the variable importance. We were able to see that age was extremely important in predicting strength. But how exactly is it important? We don't know which values are contributing to strength. Is it better if it's younger? Is it better if it's older? We can guess at that, but we can actually see specifically by creating partial dependency plots in TreeNet. So there's a Create, block, create Plots button here at the bottom. This, you can decide what type of plots you like. We have one variable dependence, which means 2D plots. We also see 3D plots if you want to look at interactions. For the sake of simplicity here, not going to get too, in bit, too advanced, we'll just do 2D and we'll select all of the variables. So this is going to create plots that show us how the variables are contributing specifically to the target variable. Now a lot of people think that these algorithms are kind of black boxes. They think you're just getting this extremely complex set of equations to partition your data and you have 500 trees, so how can you learn anything from it? But looking at those variable importance measures and looking at these plots are the best way to find out how your variables are behaving. And you really can learn a lot from these models while also benefiting from the accuracy. So I'll click Create Plots. We get a plot window for our model. 
and I'll click show all to show us these plots. Now, there's many things you can do with these plots. You can put spline approximations over these plots. You can export those approximations as new variables, and that's one of the main things that I'll be showing you next week is how to create approximations of these variables and put them back into a standard linear regression to boost the accuracy. I know there's a lot of, there are many companies out there that have strict regulations. Sometimes they can only use techniques that give you specific equations like standard linear regression. And so we like to give you guys ways to benefit from Trina advantages, but also be able to put it back into the standard framework that you're used to using and that you're allowed to use. So here we can see these plots. Age, specifically, you can see has an increase and then it plateaus around 100. Now what this means is the biggest contribution that age has is between 0 and 100. You can see there's a huge spike. It makes a huge difference between those values. And then once you get over 100, there's really no difference in contribution. These plots are always centered around zero. So you have to refrain from interpreting them based on this y-axis. It's based on contribution to your target variable. And so you're only looking at the change of y and the change of x. Again, water, you can see no change in contribution until you hit maybe about 150. And there's a steep drop here. And then it plateaus again. So based on what you're actual application is, you'll know how to interpret these and you'll be able to see the different patterns that pop up here. Because we don't know, or I specifically definitely don't know a lot about the compressive strength of concrete and the materials that make up concrete, I can't really take much away from this. But the point is that when you have the domain expertise of your problem, you'll be able to get a lot from these plots. You can open them up individually, and this is where you can set spline approximations, which I'll be showing next week. So if you couldn't tell, I like train at the most progression and classification, just because of those plots that can tell you so much about your data. Not to say that Mars doesn't either. With Mars, Because it's like linear regression, you're actually getting a lot of the same type of output. Like you're getting a equation and numbers that you can see versus with TreeNet, you're just building decision trees. So it depends on what you're looking for and what works best with your data. Because these algorithms are data driven, the results you get out of them completely depend on the data that you're putting in. So we can't say, oh, Mars always performs best on this type of data, or TreeNet always performs best, because it depends on the data that you're putting in. So that's why we always recommend to try all of these out on your data. You might find that one works a lot better than the other. And we have found that several times, which is why we can't make any statements about which ones are best. So I always try them out. I always start with a regular regression to compare and try out the different ones. So with that said, we'll go back to the slides. We saw the improvement again with TreeNet, only off by about six. Great R squared, much better than the standard linear regression. I also want to mention that this TreeNet model looks like it did worse than Mars, but I didn't really change any parameters in the TreeNet model. I kind of just ran a quick one to show you what you can get right off the bat. Once you tweak some of the parameters, maybe we could build more trees or slow down the learning of the model, I'm pretty confident that we could outperform Mars by much more than what you see here. The final algorithm we'll be going over is random forests. Like TreeNet, random forests is a collection of decision trees. Now they're just built in a different way. So instead of trying to predict the residuals at each step and adding them together like we did with TreeNet, we're just building 
a set of decision trees independently of each other and then averaging them all together. And so the idea behind it is that two heads are better than one. Many trees are better than one. So how the algorithm works is each tree in the sequence, which might be 200 trees, 500 trees, each tree is grown on a bootstrap sample from the learning data. What this means is that you sample with replacement from your data set to grow many different versions, I guess you could call them, of your data. And then you build a tree on each different version. And so you're trying to learn just in different areas and then average them all together. So you are sampling your records. And on top of that, you're sampling from your predictors as well. During the tree growing, only P predictors are selected and tried at each node. Now this is extremely useful if you have a wide data set with thousands of predictors. Instead of trying all of those predictors at each node, and when I say at each node, I mean when you're looking to split your data and you're trying to find which variable splits your data the best. If you had to search through thousands of predictors at each node, that could be extremely compute intensive. And so what happens here is Random Forest only randomly picks P of those predictors to try. So it speeds it up. And since you're building so many trees that have so many different nodes, you are still covering the entire predictor space. So you're not missing out by doing the sampling. Now by default, we use P as the square root of the total predictors. So if you have 100 predictors, you'll only be trying 10 at each node. Now the sampling in the rows and the sampling in the columns leads to low correlation and bias in this model. Law of large numbers ensures convergence. The bias is also kept low by growing the trees to a maximum depth. So as you saw with TreeNet, we had fairly small trees. And in random forest, we'll be growing them much bigger than that. And the main point here is that all of the major advantages of a single tree are preserved and we're also getting a better accuracy by combining many single trees. Okay, so last one here to try and learn. We'll head to Model Setup. Change the analysis engine to Random Forest Tree Ensembles. We're still trying a regression problem. The variables are still selected correctly. Now the testing is a little bit different for random forests. As you can see, we don't even have the option for cross-validation here. And that's because random forest by default uses out-of-bag data for testing. Now I'll try to explain this fairly quickly. If you have any questions about it, please ask. But the benefit to random forest is that you don't have to hold out a chunk of your data for testing because there's a built-in testing sample. As I mentioned, when we grow the bootstrap samples and you are sampling with replacement from your data, there are about 37% of your records that don't ever get chosen during that process. It seems like a big amount, but it is true that they just don't get chosen because some records get chosen more than once. And so now that we have this 37% of your records that are not being used to build the model, those can be used as your testing sample. So it's actually very convenient, and that's what we typically use here. So I'll just leave that selected just to show you how Random Forest works. You can always choose a separate testing method if you'd like. Finally, our Random Forest tab where we can choose how many trees to build. I'll leave the default here, which is 200. You can choose how many predictors at each node. I'll leave it at 3 because that's about the square root of our total number of predictors, which is 8. Now this is all we have to do here. Click Start, and we're building our 200 trees for random forests. Again, we get a similar output, the number of trees against the mean squared error. Just like the other engines, we have a summary. You can see the mean squared error on the out-of-bag data, this is what OOB stands for, is 25.5. So this is by far the lowest we've seen. So it seems like Random Forest is doing a very good job dealing with this data set and really finding the pattern in it. Our R squared is 91%. So this is great. 
and we're still getting the same reports here. We can still see variable importance. We're seeing similar results, age, cement, and water are most important. And we're also seeing the same residual box plot. We can see there might be a possible outlier here. So random forest does not have plots like TreeNet does, but there are some post-processing techniques that makes RF special, such as proximity matrices that can be used for clustering or outlier detection. And so those might be on the agenda for next week. Depending on the interest that we get in questions this week, I'm going to adjust for what I show next week. So hopefully all of you can tune in for that, because I think after what you learned today, if you want to learn anything further, then it will be definitely useful for you. Okay, so we have all of our final results here. And the important thing is that they've all improved on the standard linear regression in different ways. Now I did give, I am providing you all a tutorial and the data set to replicate this if you'd like. I just want to point out that if you do decide to replicate it in another software or if you change some of the parameters, you might get different results. So just keep that in mind if you decide to take this on your own. Another important thing to point out is it seems like these are great alternatives to standard linear regression. And you might be thinking, well, why would I not use these? They give me great accuracy. But sometimes this accuracy can come at the price of complexity. A standard linear regression is a simple equation that I showed you on one of those first slides. With Mars, TreeNet, and Random Forest, you're getting a bit more of a complex model. It might be harder to understand at first. It might be harder to explain to others. But in the end, the increase that you're getting in accuracy, in my opinion, is worth the complexity. So that's just something that you'll have to decide in your application. Speaking of other applications, because you are not all civil engineers out there interested in concrete, I do just want to let you know that these data mining algorithms work in many other industries, such as epidemiology, real estate, ecology, We've seen it all here, and we also have some case studies, if anyone's interested, just to show you the, the range of application that these regression data mining methods can be used in. We have model for obesity, spatial GIS data, prediction of FICO scores, uh, predicting product sales, many different industries. And if any of you do not see your industry here and are interested in how it works there, please contact us. We have many case studies in all different industries that we can send you, we can walk you through. If we don't have a case study in your industry, we'd be happy to do a proof of concept for you if you're looking to apply these to your data but you're not exactly sure how to do it. So again, I know I've mentioned this several times now, but we are having a part two to this series next week at 10 a.m. And I'll be going over nonlinear regression splines again, which is Mars, and I'll be showing you specifically how to interpret those splines in a similar form to OLS. So I'll be showing you the equation and how the basis functions fit in. I can also show you how we can plot those basis functions and how we can incorporate interactions to make our model stronger. With stochastic gradient boosting, I'll go back over those partial dependency plots. I'll show you how to set spline approximations and set them back into a standard regression framework. We'll also look at including interactions in there. If we have time, we'll go over more examples and case studies, and I'll try to base that on what I hear from the feedback from this week. Okay, so it looks like we're right on time for having some questions. A lot of the questions that we get during these webinars are a little bit more complex than I can answer over the webinar, and I like to give you all the information that I can. So I typically answer a few questions here, and then I'll answer the rest of them offline so I can give you resources and I can give you more in-depth answers. So if I don't answer your question here in the next few minutes, please be patient, and I'll hopefully have an email to you by the end of the day. If you decide you have a question after the webinar is over, you can email them to support at software-systems.com and our technical support team will get back to you. 
Again, you'll re be receiving a follow-up email with a recording of this webinar, the PowerPoint slides, the download instructions, and a tutorial with the data set. Join us next week for the part two of the series. If you haven't registered yet, please visit our website and register for that. Okay, so I'll take a look at questions over here. Okay. Okay, so I, I am getting a few questions here about SPM version 8. So for those of you who aren't familiar with our software, right now in, we're releasing is version 7. That's what you'll get download instructions for. And SPM version 8 is coming out within the next couple weeks. So if you do use 7 already and you're looking to upgrade or do some beta testing, please contact us and we'll see if we can release that to you. It does have many more features. Another question is, what is the website for the University of Irvine? Wasn't cited. Let me just bring that to you. I actually have it up here. It's called the UCI Machine Learning Repository. If you just type that into Google, it will bring you right to it. It has many different data sets. And this right here is the concrete one. If you do use this data set, I just want to warn you that most of the data sets here do have citation requests. At the bottom, you'll see that they request that you cite a certain person. So that is who I cited on the slides. And I apologize for not including this um, URL, but here it is. It's a quick Google search and will bring you to it. It's a very popular site. Another question on the tenfold cross-validation. Again, that's extremely hard to explain within a 30 seconds, but I will try and explain it quickly here, and then I'll send you a follow-up email with more, more details. But when you do tenfold cross-validation, you're splitting your data set into ten different parts. So we had a thousand records. So if I split it into ten folds, we'll have a hundred records in each fold. Now what happens during the modeling process is each fold is left out once. So for example, I would take fold one, which has a hundred records, and set it aside. I'd build the model on the remaining 900 records and then test on that left out 100 records. Then I repeat this process for each of the folds. So each fold will be left out one time and used for testing. And then the model performance measures from each of those folds are combined for your final model performance. And so this is just a way to technically incorporate every single record in your learning as well as in your testing. So for a binary response variable, what stats in the model summary would you look at instead of mean squared error? So we typically look at area under the ROC curve for a binary response variable. It's very popular, but we do also give many different statistics for binary uh, models. So it's not MSE, because that's for regression. We look at area under the ROC curve as well as a few others. Another question is, in Mars, is there a place in the results window that shows you whether you can use fewer than 40 basis functions, or does it automatically find the best fit and then tell you what the number of functions is? So yes, I'll come back to the software to show you. In this case, we can see that 28 basis functions were built. Even though I requested 40, it only needed 28. And that's because some of the basis functions get discarded in a backward stepping stage because of issues like collinearity. So if any of the basis functions are linearly dependent on each other, they're automatically discarded. So multicollinearity is not an issue. So here it did only find 28. But some models you might see that this optimal green model might be down here at 10 basis functions. So this is the window that does tell you that you can use fewer. And we give you these results windows specifically so you can choose. If you decide that you want a model with only four basis functions, you can select this model here, and it will be denoted by this red bar, and then you can see the summary measures for that model. So it's completely up to you. 
so you can decide on that trade-off between complexity and accuracy. Okay, I'm scrolling through more questions here. One question is, how would your approach differ for time series data sets? So we get this question a lot about time series. And there are several different things that you have to take into account. And a few of those things is that when you do testing, you have to create your own testing variable. Because your data is probably time ordered, you want to make sure that you're using the first, say, half of your records for testing, for learning, I'm sorry, and the later half for testing. Otherwise, it wouldn't make much sense to do random partitioning of your data because you'd be using future records to predict past records. So that's one of the things you have to take into consideration. And we also have a facility for creating lag variables. And this is extremely important in time series data. And so in the model setup window, there is a tab called lags. And this is where you can use blocking variables and set lag variables. So for example, if you wanted to predict um, product sales at a grocery store, you could use the sales from the day before, or the sales from the week before to predict it. And that's how you would set that up here. And so those are two different things we take into account when we are dealing with time series data. We have a question here about a Mac version of the software. Currently, right now, we don't have a Mac version. So people that are running on a Mac use Parallels or Bootcamp or VMware to run the software. But we are actively working on that Mac version, which you can expect to see sometime in 2016. So please stay tuned for that. And we'll be able to hopefully contact everyone that's interested in the Mac version. We have a question if we have case studies in fraud, abuse, uh, especially in insurance. The answer to that is yes, and I will get those emailed to you after the webinar. We have a question, could you clarify what the output of random forest or one of the other techniques would be? You said that it doesn't give as simple an equation as OLS, but does it still give an equation of some sort? So, the answer is no, it does not give a simple equation like OLS, but you can translate all of these models. So once you're in a window, I'll pull up the RF one to show you. There's a translate button, there's also a score button. So scoring this model just allows you to run new data through it. In translating the model, if you click into translate, the random forest algorithm that was built on your data to SAS, C, PMML, or Java. And so this is the really the only way that we can give you the output of this model in a different language, that you can look through it, you can see what's happening. But yes, that is one of the disadvantages to these techniques, is that you aren't getting spit out an exact equation as you are in OLS. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop with the questions. They are pretty complicated, but I promise that I will get them all answered to you along with resources by the end of today. So thank you all again for listening in. I hope you can join us for next week. Please send as many questions as you'd like. We'll get them answered for you. And look for your follow-up email that includes the recording, the tutorial, the data set, and the download instructions. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you all have a great day.